listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guests. I gotta tell you something, people. I'm sitting in my little cubby hole where I record my show, and I have a framed picture on the wall, and it's from when I did a live event. Uh, and it was, on, I'm looking up now, it's so long ago, it was May 29, 2014, and it was at Bob's Espresso in North Hollywood. And Bob is owned by Robert Romanus, who you better know as Damone from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And my guest came, and we packed the house, and he brought a keyboard player, and he did tunes from an album he had not yet released. And it was a great time, and he came back today, and my guest is John Kapolos. How you doing, John? I'm great. I'm really, really great. Good to be here. Good to be there. Good to be somewhere. <laughs> I got to ask you, the album... Tell me about the album, because you, you, you know, I remember you played the song to him for the room at the show, because you brought a keyboard player, and Bob's was very small, and it was a tight fit, and, and you wowed the audience, but, but tell me, how long did it take you to finally put the album together, because it was in the works seven years ago, and I remember when I think I had moved... You would email, you would message me on Facebook to invite me to the premiere party. But tell me about the whole process of you getting that album done. Well, I mean, you know, it, it's it was a little bit of a labor of love, and uh, it's an idea that I had gotten way before, and sort of a collection of songs that came together um, that I decided to uh, release. You know, in and around 2010, 2011, I started recording in earnest and doing. Uh, looking at some older recordings that hadn't been released that I'd done in the, um, uh, God, in the 90s. Um, and then it, it eventually sort of came together and got released around 2017 um, and uh, as too hip for the room. Um, and it's out there. It's on Spotify and it's, uh, it's in the world. Uh, because I do a cover of Don't You Forget About Me, it's not on YouTube uh, because of, you know, uh, licensing issues and all that stuff. I'm going to. Re I'm working on a new album, but I'm also going to release sort of a, re a redux version with just the songs that I wrote on it. But it's too hip for the room. Jeff Stradling was a piano player that I did the uh, event with with you, and um, you know, um, sort of in short, since my Second City days, but also way before when I was a kid growing up, I took piano lessons, and my I guess my first love has always been music. Uh, and theater I sort of got into, ironically, through musical theater, although I don't think musical theater is my favorite form of theater. But um, then I went, when I was at Second City, I, I learned the, sort of the art of the parody song. And uh, I, I have a lot of people I know do songs where they take a famous song, you know, like a Rodgers and Hammerstein or something, and they change the words. I've always considered that a little bit of a cheat. So I prefer to write my own words and my own music um long way around to saying it's it's a passion uh sadly i think you know uh there's a long tradition of actors being associated with music going back to you know shatner and leonard nimoy and before uh you know burl ives i guess it did well in both worlds but I, i'm i'm talking about you know in the last century but i love doing it um I can't say it's been the most successful branch of my career, but it's 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 a passion that I indulge. Um, and you know, I, the other thing is that uh, as as one gets older, I mean, I look around and so much of the music that I hear nowadays just does not appeal to me um, in sort of the, the way the form and I mean, hip hop has got its own sort of thing, um, but you know. The rhyming structure and all that stuff just is, is a head scratch. Well, it's funny because, you know, your album, because you do come from a comedy background, I mean, Second City, and then you you go out with a music talent. But, you know, it's great that you put this album out. And it was, I said that night you played some songs and it was it was great and it was fun because, you know, people in the audience really dug our show because it was, I mean, it was packed too and Bob's this little place and... And yeah, you wowed them, and I wowed them, but we both wowed them. But of course, uh, of course. <laughs> how? Okay, you're you're a kid from Toronto. Okay, how did this whole? How did you end up in Second City? Because I know the second Toronto was this, was the Toronto Second City open when you started, or how did you how did you gravitate to getting to Second City and then getting involved? Which 
help launch your career, which, you know, if you look on your IMDb, you have over 200 credits. You've been acting professionally for 40 years, which, you know, in this day and age, you don't find a lot of people that do anything for more than 20 years. Well, I mean, I think my can, I can credit my stick to to my father who <laughs> insisted that I do something and, and literally, you know, um, stick to it and just don't do something, but do something and be the best. That was a little bit of a immigrant um, credo. Uh, you know, I, I'm from London, Ontario, which is two hours from Toronto. Toronto has always been the sort of the dark center of, of Canada. It's a big city that fancies itself, you know, bigger than it is. And uh, it's got a real attitude, and, and, and it's deservedly so. It's a, it's a hell of a city. Um, Second City came to Toronto in like 1972-ish. Um, and I, w I was still in high school at that point. I sort of got involved with Second City towards the end of 1978, uh, middle of 1978, uh, having returned from Vancouver and run away from home after dropping out of university and um, having a sort of circuitous route into it. I mean, it was Second City did a, a thing at my university at Carleton. They did a performance and, and Tony Rosato... The late great was there and Robin Duke and a bunch of them. And, and I uh, fell down. I was going to take the workshops and I fell down these stairs and broke my arm. So that prohibited me from taking the workshops. Had I done that, I might have got into Second City a bit earlier. But as be that as it may, I sort of did this sojourn out west to British Columbia where I worked on an oil rig briefly and I uh, worked in a record store and starved and, and found myself, as my mother had said, Go, when you find yourself, just come home And after you found yourself. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. How does one go from an oil rig to a record store? That is the most diverse jobs I've ever I heard. I got a job through my member of parliament to work on an oil rig, and I worked for Mobile Oil uh, in Rocky Mountain House, and they sent me up to Inuvik, Taktayaktak, or where the, the Arctic Circle for about 10 days. And I got to tell you, it was the worst fucking experience of my young life. I almost lost my arm. I was a roughneck. I started dallying, daydreaming on the job. The people were horrible to me. They called me university, and they whipped tools at me. Uh, I literally cried myself to sleep every night. I was way out of my element. So one day, they flew me back to Rocky Mountain House, which is dead center of uh, Alberta, and I ran away. I woke up one morning at around 4.30 in the morning. I got my duffel bag, and I started running through the forest. And I attracted a bear that chased me for a little while. I ran out to a road and hitchhiked, and I hitchhiked all the way back to British Columbia. And if anybody wants to go on the map and see from Rocky Mountain House, be Alberta to British Columbia, it was a, a schlep. And I have found a place, place to stay in, in Vancouver, a friend's room. And the only thing I was equipped to do when I was in college, when I was in university, was I worked at a record store. So I went by a record store, and I got a gig working at AMB Sound. And, um, you know, I priced Steve Martin's album, Let's Get Small. This is in the fall of 1978. No, I'm sorry, the fall of 1977, I should say. Um, fall into winter of 1977 when his album came out. And then I had a rapprochement with my family. I came back and the whole Second City experience, but flash ahead seven years, um, it's now... 1986, and uh, I'm getting up, and I'm at the uh, Pacific Palisades Hotel, and the limo is waiting for me, and Steve Martin and I get in the limo, and we drive past the record store where seven years before I'd been pricing his album, and we're going to work on Roxanne, and I told him the story. I said, you know, and that seven-year <clears throat> interval from working in a record store and starving in Vancouver to being driven in a limo and working on Roxanne, it was uh, it's chapter one of my showbiz life. Well, and I said, to, and I said to him, you know, seven years ago I was pricing your album here, and I said uh, there are a lot of ghosts in this town, and it engendered one of the more interesting conversations I had with Steve about ghosts in the past. And he said, "You're lucky your ghosts are spread out all around the world. Mine are all in Los Angeles." <laughs> And he so, proceeded to tell me about his dad who worked at uh, Boeing and working at Disneyland and all that stuff. So let me ask you, 
from Second City, I mean, so so when you got in Second City, I know every, you were in the touring group first, then you got in the main stage. That's what took you to Chicago. Who were you, who were some of your contemporaries when you were doing that? Was was uh, Haggerty with then playing, or who was then? Well, I mean, there are contemporaries and there are contemporaries. There are people that were in the resident company that you know were not uh, would wouldn't even uh, you know dare to look at me because you know. Their feces had no aroma, as my father would say. Um, you know, there was a Jim Belushi and George Went and Audrey Neenan and Maria Ricosa and uh, um, Bruce Jarko, um, Mary Gross, Tim Kazarinski. They were all sort of ahead of me. Uh, and my, my crop of people were Mike Haggerty, Richard Kind, Isabella Hoffman, um, uh, Rick Thomas, you know, um, Dan Castellaneta was my understudy, and he's a great, great, you know, incredible talent, as, as you know. And he, you know, I was lucky that he understudied me because he was brilliant. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, my my time in Second City was, was rich and full and and full of a lot of you know, the twists and turns, and you're in your 20s, man, and people are just, they're elbowing for position, and, you know, I was 22, I got my first job there, you know, outside of the oil rig in the record store, that was it, working my dad's store, and being a itinerant university student, college student, and, you know, everybody thinks they're better than they are, of course I did, <laughs> and everybody wants to get on fucking Saturday, Saturday Night Live, you know, let's get on SNL, um, for better or for worse, I'm glad I didn't get on it, it, it ultimately. I mean, I have to say that now. But, uh, you know, Second City was a herky-jerky experience because I didn't, you know, at that time there were no classes. It's Obviously, I don't know, what, you know, since the last time we've spoken, there's been a lot of change, right? And the theater's been sold and, uh, you know, we've gone through this pandemic and, you know, they've just opened to live seating again, new ownership and with a new mandate. Um, I don't know what you know about the whole political upheaval there, but there's political upheaval everywhere now. It's any anything there is, any entertainment thing. It even happens in SAG. It's always it just seems like everything. It's since social media blew up. Everyone's just it's always shit going on, and you probably see it because you know you're you're from the old school, man. You know when you guys before social media when you know you could do stuff and not get in trouble, and then you also you had the hustle. You know I try to tell younger people. That, you know, listen to me, younger people, that, you know, like when I did stand-up comedy, we would have to sit there and, and tape. We'd have to tape our sets. So you have to buy the VHS. And then you have to put it in an envelope with your headshot. It wasn't like now you can get headshots anywhere. You got the lithograph because they were cheaper. And then you'd stick it in an envelope and you'd mail it to a club and it would cost you like 10 bucks. And then when you finally got booked in the club, you'd go into a guy's office and see your tape and say... Oh, you never watched my tape? He goes, no, I don't watch any of them. Someone told me you were funny. So it was different. I mean, now it's just, it's it's crazy. Well, you know, there's there's a speed and immediacy to the internet. It creates a lot of, you know, it makes it easier to do a lot of things, but I don't know whether it makes it better to do a lot of things. Um, just because of the ubiquity of things that we communicate with, you know, um, doesn't mean necessarily make the quality of education any better. There was a time, you know, in my family, uh, my father, you know, my, I grew up in a very tight Greek knit community, tight knit Greek community in, in, in southern Ontario. And there was a time like a cousin of ours would fart in Guelph, Ontario, and my father would hear about it two minutes later. <laughs> and now, you know, um, with all the things we have, you know, computer, cell phone, etc., I, I hear that a relative of mine died five years ago, and I hear about it, you know, five years after the fact, right? And it's like, wow. Um, nobody communicates. I mean, it, there's a distance and a sort of coolness about a, all the social media that comes with it because at the same time that people want immediacy, they can also ignore you immediately, right? <laughs> and they can, I, I don't know, um, doesn't make it any better. And uh, I've had some run-ins on social media that have really turned me off um, with people that don't understand irony or... Um, don't understand, period. Uh, I posted something a couple of years ago on Facebook that really turned my ear as to, eye as to 
Uh, and it was about it was about all the political stuff with Trump and and to go back into it, you know, to realize that there were so many fucking trolls and people out there that were doing all this harm and, and uh, realizing that I might have been doing battle with, you know, cyberbots. I just wasting my life. <laughs> I think that the, the, the thing that's really bothersome to me is that, um, yeah, we could do our shit and people wouldn't uh, troll you and all that sort of stuff and you wouldn't have to deal with your Twitter feed after a show in Second City. I mean, I, I would imagine that would be dreadful. But but also the fact that um, it takes away from just doing the, doing the work. I mean, when you're doing your stand-up or you're sitting around with those guys, I mean, and everybody's face down, like, into their cell phones, I mean, it, there's just a different vibe today. Well, yeah, ours, ours used to be, ours used to be, you'd go to the diner in Philadelphia and you'd talk and no one had phones and you would learn so much and you would actually create stuff because you'd be talking to someone and someone would go, hey, hey, you know what, you know what's, you know what's a good tagline for that? Use that. And you go, oh, that sucks, you know. And now though, people just seem to be, you're right, in their phones a lot. And I don't, I don't think it, I think it, it takes away from the interaction. I think it takes a little bit away from the spur of the moment creative process that you get when you're just hanging out with your, peers and friends well you know i mean it's it, there's a fundamental difference with the, the cell phone to me i don't give a shit i can turn the fucking thing off and um and put it away when i go to a film set i don't take it to the film set unless i want to get a picture with somebody and then i get my picture and i turn the phone off i usually leave it in my trailer or uh, you know sometimes i don't even bring it to the set because I'm so involved with what I'm doing. And also, if I want to be there, I'll talk to people. And if I don't want to talk to people, I'll just sit there and go to sleep or close my eyes or read or something. But but what it's done, obviously, and people have you know, talking about this. I mean, I read the New York Times online. I love a lot of stuff about media. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a Luddite or an ogre. But at the same time, um, you know, I don't bring it to the dinner table and fight, you know, like... Uh, Kids bring it to the dinner table, and you got to say no, 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 no. You know, t- take it somewhere else. Well, I'm just it's just in my pocket. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Just put it somewhere else. I mean, um, they're just like it's just, this doesn't occur to me to have my 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 media thing with me all the time. Now, um, yeah, it's just changed the rules of engagement and just engagement. Period. And uh, you know, my dad died in 1980. Um, 80. <laughs> and I've got this kind of strange open letter to him. And like in the first couple of years, things had changed marginally. But now, several years later, it's like it's explaining how the world has changed since 1980 is is uh, is uh, interesting. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's totally crazy. And on 1980, that's when you started acting more, getting movie roles. And, you know, as I said earlier, you've had such a long career. Tell me, I want to hear about how, how you met John Hughes because you know you were in two classic movies, and and if you're if you're a certain age, you know you see them. I and mean, I still flip around if I see Sixteen Candles at Breakfast Club, I watch them. In fact, the other night I, I had a little buzz going. I was aware. We, me and my wife were out with some friends, and I, I had a little buzz, and I was on the couch, and and I was like, "Holy crap, Breakfast Club!" And she's like, "Yeah, I know." She goes, "I love that movie, Stephen." I go, "Yeah, when it's on." And she's like, "No, Stephen, you're buzzed. I'm not, you know." But it's part. How did you get? How did because you you may not know it, but you're part of uh, of iconic movies, and also you know with Seinfeld and Miami Vice, and even part of a, a lot of iconic stuff. But how did you meet John Hughes? How did that happen? Was it the Chicago connection? Yeah, I, John was fixated on getting Chicago talent and doing something locally. His his thing uh, t- he wanted to prove to Hollywood was you could do it uh, outside of Hollywood. Yeah, and you could take, you know, you had, he had his ringers, obviously, he had all the, you know, uh, the kids, as it were. But, um, you know, he really he relied on local talent and relied on a lot of local things. I met him at a casting session that Jackie Birch had for 16 Candles. And uh, I just had a fucking great audition. And, um, you know, it was one of those th- experiences, too, where... <laughs> I mean, as I reflect upon it, I don't really think in all the interviews I've done, and yeah, I'm aware of the sort of firmament of the pop culture thing that, that I'm 
that I'm part of. And I'm, you know, I'm damn happy to be part of it. Um, they can't take it away from me. But the thing that occurs to me in retrospect was that he was one of the few guys that I'd met that was a contemporary um, in terms of like the people I was auditioning for were like John Lewis Carlino and Mike Nichols and, and, you know, uh, the second city people, Bernie and all they, they, they were, they were of a different generation. They were much older than me. They weren't even baby boomers. They were, um, you know, older and, um, and no flies on them. I respected them, but John Hughes was like, he was a baby boomer, you know? And uh, he was like Harold Ramis and like a lot of the second city guys that had just come before he was out there doing shit. And that was exciting. And, I'm telling you something, if, you know, he gave me one of the biggest boosts in my career um, without me even asking, without my agent even asking, is that he gave me main cut, main card, main title, separate card, alphabetical billing in the Breakfast Club. And that was like, um, you know, there's a lot of bullshit that goes on when you get into a movie in Hollywood. And a lot of it is like how they status, you know, you in the cast list and how they put you on the numbers list and who, who in the publicity world is going to support you when the movie comes out and all that stuff. And like, I was a neophyte when I got into all that stuff, man, you know, um, I mean, if you look on the sliding scale of, you know, working in a, working, a, in an oil rig and, and, and all that stuff, it was all sort of new to me. And, and, um, as much as I sort of read a few books about acting, all this shit was happening fast and furious, and and you know the game is always changing. So, you know, um, I mean, I, I attended the opening of the Breakfast Club uh, when I was driving down Sunset Boulevard. I was on my way up to my house, and I had groceries, and I was wearing overalls. I just come from uh, the farmers market, literally. And uh, there's Judd Nelson and John Hughes crossing the street, and they're going to the Directors Guild, and that's where they're going to the premiere screening. I wasn't even invited to it. So, you know, I mean, it's like, oh. Um, so, yeah, as much as I became part of John Hughes' Chicago world, the Hollywood world was much to, harder not to crack. And even, you know, he, I had some experiences in Hollywood with John that were kind of jarring and chilling. <laughs> You know, and so, yeah, I mean, a lot of that stuff is great. I mean, on a cultural level, um, you know, the Atlantic crossing was a lot harder than the people missed it, you know. Yeah, I came over on the Mayflower in a lot of those ship movies, you know, and a lot of them really, really helped me. But the, the voyage sometimes was a bit tough. What was it like? What was Miami Vice like? I know, I know. I believe Evan Handler was on your episode. You played Evan's lawyer. You were like the the coked out snazzy lawyer. Evan's great. Don Johnson was a trip. I mean, uh, whether I ever work with the, the the dude again, I just think that he's he's one of the more peculiar folks I've worked with in in this business. And um, I mean, you know. It's almost like he's uh, in uh, what's what's the name of that cartoon uh, um, where all the heads are in the future, uh, Futurama. I mean, he's a really Don Johnson is a really incredibly well, you know, he's like a head in a museum. He's like a bust, but um, uh, and and uh, he was really a, a trip to work with. <laughs> and uh, John Nicolella, the director, you know, it was the first season of Miami Vice, man. It was like, it was, it was New Year's, I mean, not New Year's, it was Thanksgiving of 1984. And um, I flew down to Miami and, and uh, I tried to talk to Don before the, the uh, I saw him as I'm coming out of the makeup trailer. I go, hey, yeah, hey, hey, Don, I'm playing uh, Sloan on the drug lawyer. He goes, you're playing Sloan, huh? And he just turns around and walks away. <laughs> and the AD runs up to me and he goes, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, in order, f if you're playing a bad guy, in order for Mr. Johnson to hate you on screen, he has to hate you off screen. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning of what I would call a 
beautiful relationship. But then, you know, you, you've worked a lot. You're working. You're getting lots of work. And I guess your, your first real, would you say your first real long-term project was Forever Night? Well, it's the first time I got to work in a TV series where I had a, a part. Yeah, you know, um, part of my uh, the joys of the type of actor or the type of career I've had is that, you know, I get tastes of parts, but sometimes they just don't go on long enough. Or I get killed off, or um, so. Forever Night was a chance to do an extended piece, and I, I ran with the ball. How do you prep yourself for that? Because, as you said, you're a guy who's going in and you're, I always, you know, you talk to a lot of actors who say when you're a guest star, it's sort of like a kid going into a new school, you know, and there's sometimes there's great people and there's sometimes there's dicks and it's just as easy as that, you know. And so when you sit there and finally you're in that position, do you think when you're in a position where Forever Night ran, you know, you did 48 episodes, did you become more accommodating to guest stars because you knew what they go through? I, you know, the old uh, Dukakis expression, or maybe is it Reagan? I don't know. Fish thinks from the head down. Um, you have to set the tone if you're the lead in the series. You know, uh, uh, I don't think it's any secret that what's his name? Uh, uh, David Caruso was, you know, made it very difficult to work on his show. And, um, you know, how many David Caruso series do you have working now? But, you know, somebody like Scott Bakula, who I worked with in Quantum Leap, is incredibly accommodating. He's a great, great guy to work with. So you learn from really good shows that you're on. Uh, I was on Judging Amy. I did, you know, I've done a lot of, as you said, shows. And the one thing I learned from a lot of them is, yeah, it's a little bit like first day of school. But there's also a way of your handling yourself when you're a guest star. And then when you're a lead in a show, you see how these people come in and how they're treated. And you try to ameliorate situations, and you try to make sure that the uh, the staff, the crew, the uh, ADs, everybody, um, treats people in a way that's that's good. It's very hard to be a guest star on a show, and particularly if you've got an emotional. Like, I had to come on to uh, CSI and be hogtied as a pig uh, in, in a, you know, and there I'm meeting Gary Sinise or Bill Peterson or who I worked with, you know, and I'm, I'm literally hogtied nude because I'm some guy at a swingers party, a cop that was uh, killed and, and made an example of, and it was humiliating to be in a situation like that. Hi, Bill. How are you? Good to see you. Yeah. I haven't seen you since second city days and I'm hog, hogtied like a fucking, uh, you know, piece of meat. And that's the gig, right? Um, but, Guest starring is, is I think, you know, um, you can always tell, you can always tell when somebody's a neophyte if they don't treat you well, because they go, man, you know, I, I hope you don't experience the same sort of thing that I do when I come on a show. But, you know, unfortunately, I, I, I'd like to say things are getting better, but I think that people are actually behaving worse now. Well, I wanted to ask you, what was it like when you were on Seinfeld? Because everyone remembers that episode. I mean, that's one of those things people people just remember. I loved working on the show. I mean, it was one of those things where I'm auditioning at 3 o'clock, and, 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 and they tell me after my audition, hang out for a second. And then they come back, and they said, listen, there's a 5 o'clock run-through. Can you do it with us with for network? And I'm, well, I'm not dressed. I just came here for the Emmy. And I literally got the sides of it faxed to, to me, I mean, this, you know, and then I, they say, it doesn't matter what you look like, just come down and read for this. And so I'm like, you know, in shorts and a t-shirt uh, reading. And, be, and then, then you start doing the show. I was, you know, you know, as, as professional as I am, um, and I think one of the hallmarks of being a professional is always treating it like you don't know. I mean, always sort of coming into it, uh, uh, Eyes wide open and, and, and trying to learn as much as you can <laughs> because there's no professional situation I've been in that, that is that is entirely something, oh, I got this. And there's always something to be learned and there are always new people. Now, even if you're working on a show day to day, I mean, um, there are always you know, new scripts, new this, new that. Um, I would say in, for, in terms of Forever Night, I really got used to working in front of a camera. Like at Second City, I got used to working in front of an audience. And that was invaluable um, because when I did my first movie, Tootsie, <clears throat> I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I couldn't barely, you know, keep my hands still from being so nervous whenever the camera rolled. <clears throat> and 
and that's a horrible thing. You know, stage fright, um, or or having those nerves. But you know, Seinfeld, I got to say, it was was nerve wracking in its own way because they were up to speed. They were like, you know, when I did Modern Family, same thing, and when I did Desperate Housewives, same thing. These people were. This show was humming. They were at the top of their game. They were being written about in the trades. It was the talk of the town. You know, it was the ratings were, you know, a hit for all their entities. So it's coming into situations like that. It's, you know, you got to sort of be at a certain speed to click in and click out and not, you know, cause too much uh, friction. Um, there, you know, I, I came away from Seinfeld with a couple of major league impressions. First of all, the Michael Richards, and I feel really badly what happened later on in the, at the comedy club, is one of the best, hardest working, funniest dudes I've ever worked with, period. And uh, that I, Julia Dreyfus is, deserves everything she's got. She is a queen. Those are my two takeaways. I mean, Jerry, fine. Um, and uh, the rest, you know, like that. You've worked on a lot of good shows. What was it like when you worked on Monk? Because I just started watching Monk. My wife's watched all the Monks. And I've watched it. And Monk is such a good show. And isn't he a fellow Chicago guy? Yeah. Unfortunately, I didn't get to do much of Tony Shalhoub. Um, th- there was, that was one of those shows where, you know, um, that and also Frasier. I, I had really nothing parts. And it was towards the end of the series. And they said, listen, you know, just do it. Uh, I know they want you to be on the show, but they really couldn't find anything good. And and I um, can't say much about my experience with Tony because it was uh, non-existent. Um, you know, my scenes were my scene was sort of around him, but including him, but not directly with him. Um, you know, unless you're working with the star or the leads in the show, like I did West Wing, and I worked with Martin Sheen for a day or something, you know, the the shows tend to be. A, I would I would say less memorable, but also less impactful in terms of you know the work experience. <laughs> now, now you've you've worked in a lot of shows. What was working? Yeah, jo- what was what was Justified like? Because that's that was a uh, that was a very popular show, but that had like a more of a cult following. And you, you well, I mean, Justified was one of those situations where you could take all the sort of like the stars of the show and multiply it by five, because there were like all these dudes that you know had various claims to fame in the show. So there was a lot of strutting their stuff. And then <clears throat> the other thing in Justified was um, was the sort of introduction to me. You know, as you work in show business over the last, you know, 40 years, you know, I've seen every, you know, I've seen religion, you know, I've seen it all. I've seen religion from Jesus to Paul. I mean, um, that's a John Lennon quote. Uh, my, uh, my, my larger point is that I've seen all sorts of technology. You know, I've shot on, you know, scotch tape to videotape to, to, you know, 35 millimeter film to, so in the justified experience, um, I was getting used to the new shooting on hard drives. So you've got four or five camera guys, right. And you've got all these actors hitting different marks and we're all being lit and we're doing the same scene and they're shooting it from four or five angles. And the lead actors are going, um, they're doing their lines like, okay, I want you to know that I'm going to be taking that. Okay, let me, can I try that again? I'm going to, I want you to know I'm going to be taking No, let me take it from the top. So the actors, the lead actors are telling them, you know, so they're stepping it back, you know, and they keep these takes going for like two, three, four minutes because they've got the hard drive space. In the olden days, if you're shooting on film, you know, you can only shoot a certain amount of time. you got to check the gate, the mag, the noises. But when you're gunning four or five cameras that are all going at the hard drive, so, okay, you got camera two, step back, see so-and-so's in my shot. So you're doing this dance with all these different cameras and stuff. Technically, it was an experience, right? And then um, also working with Walt, Walt Goggins and, and Tim Oliphant, these guys, again, top of their game, the show's going really well, and they couldn't be more confident and self-assured. And, you know... It's kind of like, you know, when Oral Hershiser is pitching to you. I mean, that dated reference, but like, you know, 
when, when you've got – you're up to bat and, like, there's the best pitcher in baseball. And, like, so you're going to get a good pitch. Or you're, at least you're going to get something fast or you're going to get something <laughs> – but it's a professional gig, and uh, you know, I got to work on uh, Justified with, um, with uh, of course, Walt and, and Tim Oliphant, and uh, um, 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 oh God, now I'm, I'm blanking on the name. Um, uh, Linda Thomason's uh, friend, Linda Bloodworth Thomason's friend, uh, actress uh, from uh, Back to the Future. Um, Leah Thompson. The audience will figure this one out. But, um, oh, come on, John. Um, no, no, I'm filling the blank. Uh, I got to work with this wonderful actress whose name I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> How's that for a career? <laughs> In your career, how many times have you got killed? Oh, God damn it. We should add them up. I would say at least 20, 25. Now, do you, do you have a favorite kill scene? And do you have one that you said, eh? <laughs> I, I just did Big Sky. I think Big Sky is probably my favorite up to date. Tell me about Big Sky. And we watched that because, as I said, it's funny. And I also want to talk about the Hallmark because uh, my wife always, my wife, when she sees you, goes, oh, John Kavlos is on. She always tells me. But we were watching Big Sky and you show up. And it's funny because we, you were, you played, I guess, as a preacher or a priest. And it was funny because you drove a Tesla. And I was like, that's a Tesla. And she's like, oh, no, no man of the cloth would drive a Tesla. And I was like, no, that's a fucking Tesla. Big Sky, first of all, did you audition for that or did you just get that offer? It was an offer. Now, now for you, you get a lot of offers. But also now, I'm sure everyone has to audition. Do you mind being on tape when you do your audition or do you miss the room that you used to have to go into? Well, you know, um, initially I missed the room, um, but there is something to be said about having being once you understand the process of self taping and, and get a handle on it at least. Understanding it is one thing; I'm getting a good handle on it is another. Then, then you can, then you can start um, perfecting it with the speed, working on them in a way that you probably uh, wouldn't uh, at a regular audition. But that said, <laughs> to be blunt, I've probably been on 30, 35 taped auditions this year and haven't got one. So, um, you know, people think that, oh, well, you know, you, John, you get offered shit all the time. Well, I, I get offered stuff occasionally, and it's wonderful. And uh, it, that, that, that also brings an entirely different vibe, because when you get offered something, they anticipate you doing it a certain way. And then if you don't deliver it that way, they're going, oh, well, wait a minute, you know. Um, you can always sense. So I, I think there's a lot of validity and actually, actually good stuff about the audition process. Because by the time they decide upon you, they're confident in ways that um, they might not be otherwise. You know, sometimes an offer can come with strings or sometimes an offer can be given with not always the agreement of all the producers. And uh, I've been in a situation very, I've been in one situation that was, you know, like where you just didn't have the unanimity of producers wanting you in on that. And somebody makes it very clear, you know, I didn't want you to do this. It's like, oh, great. You know, and, and when you get that, it's like that, that chops at your tree. That doesn't make more, that doesn't work for me. It's nice when people, you know, it's nice when people are nice and they want you to be nice and they want you to be in the room nicely. You know. Um, auditioning is also, I think, uh, I have to say that they, I, I think that they're dr drowning in a sea of choices because the thing is now with video auditioning, a guy from Atlanta or somebody from Toronto or from Yellowknife or Tuktoyuk Tuk or, you know, San Francisco or wherever can send in their audition. So you're in a bigger talent pool, you know, um, theoretically. And sometimes, you know, like when you're seeing 40, 50 actors for the part, it's ridiculous. And from the other side of it, I know that I'm talking up a storm here, but um, from the other side of it, when I've cast stuff, it's really amazing to me when you really come down to it that there are very few actors that are actually right for the gig. 
Now, let me ask something. You know, you said you're pulling from a bigger pool, and you said you've done 35 taped auditions this year, and you haven't gotten one. You're someone who's had a, a, a great career. As I said, you know, there's a lot of people who have 200, over 200 IMDb credits. Um, now, how do you, what keeps you going? I mean, there's got to be sometimes, you know, I mean, I know you can say, people say, well, it's second nature, you know, if you knock on so many doors, but you've had offers, you've had, you've had, you know, auditions, you've been on big shows, you've been in iconic movies. What keeps you going inside? Is it just the love for acting or is it you sit there and go, I don't want to go back and work on an oil rig? Well, I mean, you know, um, huh. That's a damn good question. In, in that, you know, you could. There, the standard responses are. I mean, you know, um, what else am I going to do? I'm a little bit of a workaholic. I mean, and these are not. These are not only standard, but they're true. Um, I was so driven by my father, like you know, by the t I was the youngest of three, and when my dad was twelve or thirteen, you know, a lot of kids are coddled, and uh, my parents were Greek and uh, or of Greek descent, and sometimes Greek kids get coddled a bit, but not the least my father couldn't wait for me to get out of the house when i was 13 14 so he and, and he said you know you gotta you gotta decide something and he was a child of the depression this is all by way of explaining my workaholism um i love doing it it's one of the few gigs you know and this is i guess i suppose a bit of a cliche where you want to do more of it you know um i remember reading an article where mary tyler moore was about towards the end of her life and she was disappointed because she auditioned for something and didn't get it and a friend of mine read the same article and he said well why the hell would you want another job I mean you know and I looked at him I said why would you want another breath and I think that's about as simple as I can make it it just it's a raison d'etre for me I love acting I love the process my partner Heidi can tell you that I love watching movies I'm an inveterate movie watcher I love to write um, you know, um, and, you know, as much as you, you've been in stuff, I mean, there, there is something, <laughs> there is something to be said about having done stuff and like, yeah, it's in the past. I mean, um, it's, it's always good to be moving ahead in something. And, um, what keeps me going, I think, is the thought of perhaps uh, being involved in a project that has, you know, a great import and that changes people. You know, the thing that's really interesting, Steve, is that people don't understand that, you know, when I told my father I wanted to do, be in the film business, he was kind of a prescient guy. He said, you know, there are people who are going to be spending a lot of money in entertainment. But I think what people really didn't understand, and my father didn't get, and my father loved books and ideas and reading. I mean, he loved literature, was how important films were going to be in terms of the literacy of the generations. People are reading less. So films like The Breakfast Club or Sixteen Candles or 80s movies, they have a strange uh, deal of, of more sort of import than one even imagined. Maybe too much, but that's another discussion. Now, we, we, I mentioned Big Sky, and, and you can go into it as well. Am I being boring? Am I being too... Uh... No, no, not at all. But I, I, I had to get this off my mind about Big Sky, because you were, I don't know if you were joking on the phone yesterday, but I want to find out about the fight scene. Like, did they cut it? Yeah. Did they stop you? Because you got your ass kicked. And people, if you didn't see it, I won't tell you what Brooke Smith did, but uh, <laughs> you got... Well, your... I'll tell you what did happen, is that um, uh, the fridge that I was banged into fell right next to me, and it was a... You know, and, and it could have crushed my toes, feet, body. So there was a moment of absolute sheer horror. We're doing the stunts on that. Nobody had um, secured the fridge against the wall. Uh, and that was a moment where, like, I really could have been hurt. Um, we had a stunt guy come in, but I did a lot of the shit myself. And they threw him into the last second. Um, it's, it's, you know... <laughs> Like, when I read the part, I thought, this is going to be fun. It's going to be fun. You just don't want to be hurt. Right. So, you know, putting my head in the, in the water and all that stuff, that was fun. It was challenging. How would that, but that's just like shit. You sit there and go, man, he, he, he's earning his money on that one. Yeah, but, you know, that's the sort of stuff I play with my kids in the deep end of the pool and, you know, pretend I'm dead and... 
Now, in the Umbrella Academy, you play Jack Ruby. What's it like to play someone in real life? Have you played a real-life person before? I have. I played Leonard Weingloss in uh, uh, The Sea Will Tell. And they had to change the character because he sued CBS. He hated the portrayal. <laughs> he was a famed defense attorney, Len Weinglass. So they changed my name to, like, Spencer Mindlass or something. I don't know. Um, that was a movie with Richard Crenna and Rachel Ward. And uh, But, I mean, the, the thing about playing this real character at the Umbrella Academy is how real was the character? Of, they, they're basically going click and grab with the characters in the Umbrella Academy. They're not really doing Jack Ruby. They're not doing a recreation of the Kennedy assassination with, you know, so I'm not really doing Jack Ruby. I'm doing this sort of sci-fi click and grab version of Jack Ruby. And um, that was kind of fun. Um, That was kind of fun. Why do you just say kind of? Oh, because uh, some of the stuff on the Umbrella Academy was a bit, one of the directors was a total not just nut nutcase. I don't know how he got the kick. And like he kind of boned me on a few shots. And you know, I watched this thing recently about an actor on, on, on you know, how like the first three, four movies were fun and then it became work. And I went, Oh boo hoo. But it's work, right? It's work. And um you know, we were shooting this scene and it was complex and a lot of people and stuff. And I said, This guy's not covering it right. He's not doing it right. And he wasn't. And uh, he ended up boning me because he needed me to be holding this dog, right? I had to hold this dog, and then I didn't hold the dog. And um, they fucked it up, so they couldn't use half my work that day. You know? And, uh, you know... um, Does that frustrate you? I mean, when you're a professional, you work with so many people. Does that frustrate you or does it piss you off? Like, when you know more than the director, which, you know, and you're not, you're saying that from experience, but when you know the coverage, how does it make you feel? Does that, does that um, change your time on the show? Does that sour it a little bit? Yeah, well, it, 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 it did, it did in this case. And the thing is that the, the, the problem is, you know, and file this under life, life in, 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 you know, in the adult lane of any job, it's like they hire you to do your job and then they don't let you do it. So it's like, well, wait a second. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Director, uh, what you're doing here is like, yeah, yeah, I don't have any time for that. Right? Yeah, don't worry. The way we're gonna, yeah, yeah, yeah. I worked with Peter Himes on The Relic, which I call The Smellic. It was one of the worst movies I've ever been involved with, with uh, More Size Tom, that actor. Um, it was like a piece of, piece of work. Um, one, one of the three actors, I could say, that you know, truly dreadful to be around. Um, <laughs> and Peter Himes, the director, was a piece of work. And there was this sequence we were shooting where um, uh, Penelope Ann Miller, whatever, she's being run, run, she's running away from this this monster, and the monster's like <gasps> breathing in the basement, and she makes this determined look, like, okay, I'm going to run away from him. And she's just smashed all these beaker bottles down, and she they go down her long, lithe legs, and they go down to her feet, and she takes off her shoes, and now she's going to run because she's got these high heel shoes on. And all I can think about is she's going to run through all this glass and cut her feet. So I turned to the director because they're about to shoot the sequence. I said, but isn't she going to cut her feet? He looks over and he roars back to me. The way I'm going to cut it, they're not even going to think about that. All right? And it's like, and I, I don't know what I was thinking. You know, it's just sitting there with the other actors in their chairs and they're about to shoot this sequence. And, and I thought, well, so lo and behold, flash ahead on, on this little Fakakta movie theater on Fairfax that's now closed. It's uh, on the corner of Fairfax and Beverly, where I'm watching the movie eight, like 12 months later for like 60 cents. Uh, and I'm in the theater and there are these five old Jewish ladies behind me. And we come to that part in the movie and they go down her legs and she takes off her shoes and the woman behind me goes, she's going to cut her feet. (laughs) It's like, yeah, yeah, you can make a multi-million dollar fucking movie. And like, if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. And no, go ahead. I'm saying it's like it's just funny because yeah, you, you've had so many experiences, and I always wonder. You know, you you probably get recognized by so many different people for so many different roles. How has 
the, the Crossword Mysteries come into your career by getting recognized because I never knew the social phenomenon of Hallmark movies. And my wife watches them all the time. And Gregory Harrison's been on the show a bunch. He's done a ton of Christmas movies. And I give him a hard time going, oh, there's we're decorating a Christmas tree. I said, I see you on TV. He's like, oh, I've been on a few. How did that come about? And you've been, what, did you, you know it's going to be recurring? Hard, you can give me a hard time. No, I'm serious. Did you did you know it'd be recurring? Or because you're on a bunch of them. Um, yeah, I mean, it came at a time where um, uh, I was sort of, like surprised that they would come after me um, because I'd had some sort of controversy in my life, stupidly, um, that I, I don't even need to address because it was just a bullshit uh, thing. <laughs> and I said, okay, um, if you guys really want to work with me, I'd like to work with you. You're a good, clean entity in an outfit. Their money was good. And, you know, I mean, I've done a lot of different stuff. I've done soap operas. I mean, I've I've done I've done things that. Um, when I was in my twenties, I asked Bernie Sullins, "Why is so and so, some famous Second City actor, doing this piece of shit? Somebody who's much older than me." And he turned to me and he goes, "For the fucking money, you idiot!" <laughs> and um, <laughs> after a point in time, you know, um, not every decision has gone with the wind. And like to do the crossword mysteries, like I don't know the Hallmark people, but I got to tell you, the the Crown, the, the, the company that runs Hallmark, these people are kind of the classiest people I've ever worked with, and they treat me well. The scripts are, they're nice. They're um, they're you know they let me play with them. They're not um, they're not you know, they're not. They're not scripts that, that are bad. They're just scripts that appeal to a certain demographic. And, like, women like them. And I, I, there's a theory that in terms of that they have a huge female audience. They also have a huge male audience. Um, I'm pleased with the associations like Brendan Elliott and Barbara Niven and all the people I work with are great. Um, and Amy Krell, who produces it. So, you know... I don't think, you know, the more I do this stuff, sometimes, you know, the level of import that people attribute to their gigs, you know, um, when you're working on a show where people think, you know, this is really like I'm doing something important, where people had a lot of attitude, like Justified. There was a lot of attitude to go around. I mean, sometimes that just sort of, in retrospect, game seems kind of silly because everything ends up on TV and everything ends up a little bit dated. And after time, things get sorted out, you know. Um, and my Matlock is right next to my little part in Tootsie, which is right next to The Breakfast Club, which is right next to Big Sky, which is, you know, and all gets mixed up. And um, I just love the fact that, um, you know, in these in these in these parts of the process, and even in the Hallmark stuff, I'm allowed to take chances and fail, you know, and, um, like, sometimes it doesn't work, and uh, in front of the camera, and that's, that's always good. <laughs> now, what do you have coming up? I mean, how, how has, how has the, how has the pandemic affected your acting career, whereas, you know, I know sets have changed a lot, but you seem, you know, you, you were working during it, and what do you have coming up? Well, I mean, I did two uh, two week stints in Canada of quarantine, where I sat in a hotel room by myself for two weeks, and I did that twice. And then when I came back here, I had to quarantine. So, you know, uh, emotionally, I found that very hard. Um, granted, we got paid for that, and that's not going to happen again. So, and paid handsomely. So there is that upside. You know, they had to pay you for sitting in a room. You're just not doing this for nothing, um, which was strange sensation. Um, I worked on the shows and they had COVID protocol and all that. I mean, I really didn't know whether we were going to act again a year ago when all this was starting up. I didn't know how it was going to work for everybody. Um, you know, I unfortunately had to drop out of a Guillermo del Toro movie because the timing didn't work out. I was going to be in Nightmare Alley with, um, with him, but uh, that, that was a drag. And, um, 
and I, uh, you know, have, there have been several other things that I've not worked out. So we'll see how things go. <laughs> I mean, coming up, um, I'm doing this film called The Class in Chicago with Michael Hall, and it's sort of a bit of a reminiscence of The Breakfast Club in it, and it's a good script. And I, I play a very small part in that um, for a couple of days, but it's going to be a lot of fun. And um, I'm writing a script right now with uh, two other guys. We've been working on it for a long time for a series called The Visiting Professor for Netflix or for um, Amazon. We're, we're pitching it to both streaming authorities right now, streaming authorities, streaming services. <laughs> and then uh, I'm also involved in another project uh, where I've optioned a book of uh, an author, Stephen Koss, of The Fever of 1721, which is about the first smallpox outbreak in Boston and the uh, discovery of inoculation. And that one is a project which is having a, an interesting time out in the marketplace right now. And I love to write, and I'm working on another album, and uh, like that. Any live shows? Two, two, any two hip for the, any, you going to do any live performances? Because well, you know- I was, I'm, I'm going out tomorrow morning with a, a morning hike with Jeff Stradling, the guy that played piano at the gig. And uh, we're going to be talking about perhaps doing another live show. Um, because you should, you, you should know, mix, I'm, you should mix your music in with some of your stories, and people would love it. Because that night, you know, we did the show. People enjoyed the music, but you have great stories, and I think it's something that people like that now. I think people, you know, I'm a big Springsteen fan. Well, you know what, Springsteen, you always love when he tells that one story. He always tells this, and you sit there and you go. Holy shit! You know that, and, and so you should do something like that because people would. Well, I mean, it. I'm not. I've always loved Springsteen. I've, I've not. I've not like you know. I mean, but the, no flies in Bruce. But when I saw bits of his his show, I mean, I love the Wild, the Innocent, the East Street Shuffle. To me, there's no other better album of his. Period. To me, <laughs> but no flies on his other albums. But it's really an interesting show. And then what's his name uh, from from the Kinks? Um, did one too, Dave Davies. Right, yeah. And, um, you know, I've been threatening to write sort of a showbiz uh, uh, memoir. I just read in January, I decided to read, you know, I read Frank Langella's and I read Charles Grodin's, and unfortunately, Charles just passed away. But um, they're fun to read and they're fun to talk about. They're a little bit gossipy, but, you know. The thing is that, you know, when like a person like Charles Grodin passes away, uh, I spent a whole day uh, with De Niro reading for every part under the sun for Midnight Run with Martin Brust, and I didn't get any part. But I spent the day with De Niro, um, which was which was great. And, uh, you know, Charles Grodin was around, and I saw him, and I met him briefly, and I, you know... For me, you know, the, the opportunity to be with those people was amazing. That's all. That's all. Well, that's good, man. I'm glad that we took the time to talk. You've had a great career. And uh, I know now your website is johncapolos.com. We can yeah, it needs some work, but yeah. And we're going to be selling more product there in the future. And the, the uh, you can find your CD on? Spotify and uh, iTunes. And uh, it's Too Hip for the Room. It's on Carpuzzi Music. And, um, yeah. Well, people, so go check out John Kaplan. Look at his work. He's great in Miami Vice and Seinfeld. Yeah, you know, they're, just, they're classic roles. That they, I, just, I, had this, I had this Miami Vice thing a while ago, and Sandra Santiago was on, and then Terry Kinney was on, and Evan Handler was on my show. And I'd be watching Miami Vice, and I'd be like, holy shit, look who's on there. And there were so many people. And it's looking back, it's, you know, it's they couldn't get away with the dialogue these days. But back then, it was just so great because I was living that. I used to have the Blazers. So people, go through and look at, watch all his, and watch him on Big Sky. It's a great scene. And you'll see a man of a cloth in a Tesla, which you don't see that a lot. And anyway, people, so check him out. Check him out on site. Just check out everything. Uh, go to my website, coopertalk.net. You can find over 850 episodes. Email me, cooper at coopertalk.net. Twitter at coopertalk. Instagram at coopertalk1. Remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. And don't forget to drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Thank you.